I worked on uh, a project which was like a dream for me. Uh, it was a rebranding a video game that is a, a long running series and it's a game that I used to play. Do you do you remember how we how and when we started working together? Yeah, I do. Do you remember? I asked you a question on Instagram. Yeah, that's kind of random. Yeah, you had some IG stories and uh, I asked you a question, just looking for a bit of advice. I had found you on YouTube and then you were like, oh, are you interested in teaching? And like you checked out my stuff and then you're like, we're looking for people. And then we had a call and then kind of went from there. So it's been two years now, almost exactly that I've been... Uh, producing videos up on the YouTube channel. Yeah. So it was, I think it was kind of like I did a Q&A on Instagram with like, ask me a question. And I think your question was like, how do, how can I start teaching online or something like that? And then I was like, do you want to teach online? Let's, let's give this a try. And we did a, a few, we did a few tries. And then I think we were at a position, I don't remember if it was 2020 or 2021, we were like, okay, we're going to focus only on our internal team. So we kind of said like, maybe not, not, let's not continue. And then Ismail from our team who was doing all the content on Instagram and some of the YouTube has left. And I was like, Matt, come back. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's been one of my best kind of like bets team wise, uh, that turned out really, really good, you know, at least for the company, I don't know what it's like for you, but. <laughs> I, I saw that you recently kind of like shared on LinkedIn all the videos that you did and stuff. Like, what did you learn uh, about creating content through this period? Yeah, thanks, man. That's very cool of you to say. Um, I think it's the medium that really emphasized the fact that you have to tailor anything you do to the particular medium. That's something as designers we should know because we're always talking to different audiences and wherever we go into a project, we're talking to the client, we may be looking at research, we may be looking at the questions, uh, their answers to the questions that we have and trying to say, who are we trying to reach? But I probably came into YouTube thinking, you know, I'm pretty confident communicating. I've spoken at some big events, you know, I've done things in person. I don't find that intimidating. I've produced, you know, video content for other people. So I wouldn't say I was overconfident, but I felt like I could do a good job. But I think it's just reminded me again and YouTube is so brutal because there's so much data and so many numbers that are just you know there for everybody to see that you get reminded very quickly that every format is different every media is different and you have to learn the skills of the medium and be very aware of whom you're talking to as well to succeed yeah although I do feel like you know, we can make a really good video that doesn't necessarily pick off. Like right now we have, I think one of the best videos we had in a while that you've done. And I was like, oh, this is going to be so viral. People are going to love it. And it was like, no, just like a regular video. Like, I don't understand this. And so it's still, even after I'm doing this for years, I mean, I can't really predict what's going to happen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? Because I think like my most viewed video on the channel it's got about 300,000 views and it's a layout tutorial like literally the first part of just teaching principles of layout and it's very I wouldn't say dry I'd say it's engaging there's lots of examples but it's very much like teaching principles from A to B to C yeah it's uh, not designed to be viral no or like, and yeah common wisdom or attention yeah because people think on YouTube like you've got to be wacky and everyone needs to be like a a prank channel or something like this, you know, and that's how you get people's attention and just be more sensational and quicker and faster and all the rest of it. But actually, like, I consume a lot of YouTube, you know, like I'm in my 40s and I don't watch things like that. And I watch a lot of things that are slower and more considered and more artistic. And there's there's a whole breadth of, of people out there and people come at different moments. Maybe when they want to learn something, they're in a different mode to when they're just scrolling through and it's yeah as you say it's very difficult to predict there's a few different types of freelancers and you're mostly as as far as i understand the type that works with mainly with student with studios and agencies rather than work directly with clients can you share a little bit about how that how you made that choice why you made that choice how is that working out for you yeah i, I do both in in truth i sort of have the like three arms now, I've been doing a lot of work with yourself with Flux and teaching. 
Um, I work directly with some clients and yeah, I also work with other studios and agencies. So yeah, that aspect, I think that is often a lot more local, a lot more maybe country or regional specific, unless you are the absolute best in the world. You know, if you're the best cinematographer in the world and you're based in Sydney, you might get a gig in London. But if you're not, you know, and I'm not the number one best in the world at any discipline, then that tends to be more regional. But um, yeah, I work quite a bit with uh, either design studios. So like the last couple of weeks, I've been working with a conceptual artist in a design studio. And then I also work with more traditional integrated ad agencies. So if you're not familiar with that, that's the people who do kind of the big adverts for the big companies that you see everywhere. So adverts that you might see at the cinema or on TV, things that you would see on huge boards at the airport or around in cities. Um, you know, campaigns that would be, you know, then translate onto, you know, social, on the web, adverts like that, adverts in magazines, you know, and they kind of do the whole integrated sort of campaign. So, yeah, I kind of move between doing integrated art direction, which tends to be with ad agencies and design at design studios. When I started out, I also started up as a, in a advertising agency and design agencies. I, I also worked in McCann. So I'm very familiar with that word, world. However, I don't know if that's because my kind of like world when I moved into working with tech startups and my whole life became kind of like web design and app design and that kind of stuff. It felt to me like maybe there's not much opportunity in the traditional world of either graphic design or advertising, but you work on like crazy big projects uh, you've mentioned Formula One now, which is like crazy and other kind of like huge projects. So do you feel like there are big opportunities there? People are missing out on it. What, is that not just talked about? Yeah, I think it's like, you know, when you get a new car, you, you think, I didn't, I thought I was unique. And you find out everyone on the road drives this car, you know, it's what, it's what you see and what you're aware of. Like, so yeah, there's a lot of, talk about web we talk about web mainly you know on fox but in both branding that i do a lot of work in and also in integrating advertising yeah there's a huge amount of work i mean yeah with working some of the big agencies in london who are you know amongst the best in the world uh they work for literally the biggest companies in the world you know i've worked for the companies over the last 18 months that are in the most valuable in the world in the top 10 and they have crazy budgets you know we did some activations you know, recently, and they're spending millions and millions of dollars, you know, just on. Okay, so again, it's the lingo within things. So an activation is like an in-person or an interactive component to an event. So for example, with the Formula One thing that you mentioned, we were working with one of the principal sponsors and we created these activations. I was art directing that were appeared at every single Grand Prix. So if you go along to the Grand Prix, there will be something there that is physical that is there for you to interact with you know as a customer so that that's a popular thing so people will see that you know maybe if you go to your local shopping mall you know or a train station you'll see things that are happening maybe there's something you can go and get involved with or try out and activations are a huge thing now because people are able to share them and if it's share worthy then they get their distribution and their reach from the the crowdsourcing you know the sharing and distribution of it as opposed to uh, just paid content so that can often be part of it but yeah I think there's massive opportunities so if I'm working on an integrated campaign it could be everything from art directing a photography or a film shoot it could be working on magazine layouts you know things like uh, you might see in fashion magazines or in business magazines it could be led screens or billboards that you would see in cities it could be things for the web like um like digital adverts and banners. It could be a mini website. It could be an app that links into an activation. It could be, you know, an in-person thing. Like if you think of exhibitions and things like that, you know, you've got the physical stands. How are they going to look? You know, not just the graphics that are on them as well. It can be uniforms. It can be merchandise. So there's, there's so many things, you know, everything is designed, you know, that is created. And there is a, a massive amount of, yeah opportunity in all those uh, little niches as well so if we're doing something like that we might have five agencies working on a project and I might be working with the lead agency I did something earlier this year where I was art directing with the lead agency and then we had for example an agency in Dubai that was developing an app 
So then that agency would report into us and we w were their client, you know, and so we would art direct them from what they were doing and the creative director would import and the accounts would import. And then we as the lead agency would be presenting everything to the the end client, you know, who's who's paying the bill at the end of the day. Got it. That sounds crazy. I got so many questions on this, but but start with how did you how did you get to work with these big agencies? Well, there's basically two ways you can get to work with anybody. You can and the freelancer, by the way, yeah. right? Like you're yeah, yeah, this is for that. And that's correct. Yeah, as a freelancer. So there's two ways you can work with anybody. One is to introduce yourself, and the other one is for someone else to introduce you. So, so simple. for anyone out there, <laughs> yeah, but it's true. So for anyone out there, you either, you find the right person. So sometimes they have a head of talent. Sometimes they have a head of creative services. It might be a creative director, for example, at a design studio, or they might have some sort of operations manager. It's very easy to find who these people are, you know, in and LinkedIn and also in the press. You know, these kind of agencies are always in the press. You can find out who these people are. But you can approach them directly and talk about what you do and the others to be introduced. So when you're in an industry for a long time, you meet a lot of people. And if you're conscious about meeting people all the time, that leads to introductions and recommendations that help. The other way you can do it, and again, this tends to be country-based or regional-based, like maybe in the EU contained or contained within the UK, contained within Australia or North America. I don't really have any knowledge of other markets beyond that. Then uh, there are recruiters. So recruiting firms are a big part of this. So they will have the relationships with the agencies and then they will have the talent, the pool of freelancers. And the agencies need to expand and contract based on, you know, the client wins. And they'll win a client, they'll need certain help, and then they'll be looking for people. They might need somebody for three days. They might need somebody for six months. Um, but a lot of people are doing this kind of contracting. I got a friend... Um, who lives in the next town to me and he's a UX designer and he does incredible work and he's been able to, you know, increase his rates, you know, 500, 600, 700 pounds, which is like $900 a day, um, even on long-term contracts, you know, and getting that paid that for months, you know, and so there's a, there's, there's a lot of opportunity he's getting his work from recruiters. Yeah. He sense. gets his work from recruiters. Yeah. Almost exclusively. And he works from home and he makes that kind of money. Um, so he he can easily make, you know, one hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred thousand dollars working from home and not even working all all the time. What has worked for you, like specifically? I don't know if McCann is just a name that I know because I work there. But like, how did that happen? Yeah, that um, I've mentioned to you before. I've done some work with McCann. For those who don't know, it's the largest ad group in the world, and they have different like offices all over the world. And yeah, that originally came through a recruiter, but um, I've been doing things with them in particular for about 18 months now. And I think what works is the same with anything, doing a good job. Like when you go into any role, whether you're taking on your own project or you're freelancing somewhere, people are taking a chance on you. You know, even though they've seen your portfolio, sometimes that can be a bit misleading, you know. Um, so they want to see how you work in their environment and what you do. So it's it's just about doing the best with what you've been given. Like when I first went into some of the bigger agencies I've worked with, they maybe give you something very simple to do, like a project's halfway through. And um, I think the first thing I did with a camp, for example, was finishing some brand guidelines that were like half done already. So there wasn't much creativity. There wasn't much input there, but you do a job with that and you get a little bit more opportunity. You do a good job with that and you get a little bit more opportunity and I think that's the same for any career, isn't it? It's the same for people who are in house. You always have to do that extra and push and work as if you're the level above and act as if you're the level above when you go into to something. You know, if you're a middleweight designer, then take pride in your work like a senior. Don't say when I'm paid as a senior or when I've got the title of a senior, then I'll take the care that a senior does. That's a good way to never get there. So it's always be willing to learn and push yourself and take opportunities and push yourself forward. Like I've had some other agencies that have, have presented into and uh, internal ideas and had the opportunity to do some creative. And they've said, we can't present this better than you. You just present it to the client. And that could be like, I'm nervous. It's a big client. I don't know how these meetings go. But I just say yes. I just say yes to things. 
and you get the opportunity and you do the best that you can and you get feedback and it keeps leading leading to more and when you're starting out these things can be like i could never work on a project like that you know this just seems so far out there and maybe you you know you're doing a job for your uncle who's a local plumber or something and you think like where how do i get from here to there but it doesn't always work out how how you think it does it doesn't always look like you think it will and just keep saying yes to things keep meeting people keep doing a good job and you will get there and you need patience so if you're in a difficult market and you've been doing design for six months don't think you're going to be making a hundred thousand us dollars next year you know you're not going to be you need to be patient it's a long career and just commit to doing good work and enjoy the work and enjoy uh, being part of the industry and enjoy meeting people and be a good person to work with and do all the basic things right like turn up early and you know do your timesheets keep a record of what you're doing keep your files well organized like people appreciate these things more than you know because they're not really looking for the next Andy Warhol, the next Damien Hirst, the next person with the craziest ideas. Most of the time, people want somebody reliable because that's what makes their job easier. So it's not that difficult, I don't think, to be reliable and to be a great person to work with and always be positive. And when things are going wrong and people are stressed out, you, you let them know that you're calm and you're in control and you're on top of things. They're the kind of people who get booked more and more, and they're the kind of people I hire as well when I need to use freelancers. One thing I'm curious about is I know a lot of the projects that you work on, because they're big and you know, you've know you worked with an agency, you're either not allowed to talk about them or show them in your portfolio, which is really True. kind of like tricky in terms of, all right, so how do I build my portfolio? How do I roll this and leverage this into the next opportunity? How does that work for you? To be honest, this is one of the things I'm I'm struggling with at the moment. So the last two weeks, I worked on uh, a project which was like a dream for me. Uh, it was a rebranding a video game that is a, a long running series, and it's a game that I used to play like years back. I don't think I've played video games for twenty five years Hawk? or something. <laughs> is it Tony it's Hawk? It's not Tony Hawk, <laughs> but it was around when Tony Hawk was around, you know. And it's got the same level of longevity, and it's popular all over the world, and um, the, you know, the artist that I was working with is like so secretive about it, you know, and it, it, to be fair, the work won't be released until the end of 2024. So you even talk about how that's going to help me in my portfolio. Well, it won't even come out till then. So if I'm able to share about it at that point when I'll have to ask for permission, it's not going to make an impact until at least we go into 2025. Whereas right now I have to, you know... <laughs> earn right now to pay my mortgage and look after my three kids and all the rest of it so yeah that is a massive challenge that's something i am actively struggling with you know my portfolio are kind of a trophies because i'm busy you know working on all these other things i think the one thing i've been able to do that's been able to help me is i've been able to get recommendations so i'm able to get recommendations from people who have real weight behind them so if you've got the head of creative services at an agency that people know about that's a really significant recommendation and it's much more significant than just you do a website for a local gardening company and they say yeah it was great great job easy to work with that might help you get another gardening company but it won't necessarily you know open the doors into into bigger projects if that's what you want to work on but there's no better or worse or right or wrong it's just what you want to work on really so you you work on you you live in basically like a small town, not in like one of the major cities. Does that affect, do you feel like it affects your opportunities? Is it a barrier? Is that a good thing for your whatever life quality? Is this less stressful? Like what's, how do you see this play into your, your, your life? That's come up more in the last year. So the last previous few years, because of the pandemic, people have been really comfortable with remote, especially clients from London. Now, for me to get to London, I'm about one hour north of Manchester. It would take four to six hours to get into central London. So a lot of contract work that's coming up now, people are looking for hybrid two days in the office in London, three days at home. Well, I can't do that. I take the kids to school every morning. So that's not an option. So that is becoming more of an issue with that kind of work. 
for me, yeah, it's a definite choice. Like my wife and I, my wife's actually from the United States and we chose to live where we live. We live in the countryside, like not in like the middle of nowhere. It's like quite a good sized village, but it's right on the edge of the country. It's a really beautiful part of the world. And we just love living there. We have a, a great lifestyle. You know, it's great for the kids. They go to the village school, the village sports club. We can go straight out into the countryside on any weekend. And I think for people who work on screens all week, this is such a massive thing. Like I really think if you're a designer, having your hobby being, you know, video games or some other type of design or something like that, I think that can be a really dangerous thing, you know, spending your evenings, you know, scrolling on your phone. I think it's really important to do things like I tend to fill most of my evenings and weekends with not being on the screen, with playing sport with my friends, with reading books, with you know, going out on walks, you know, going and exploring places. And I think that's really important. So I'm able to have that sort of lifestyle. Whereas if we were living in central London, there'd probably be a lot of other opportunities. Maybe I could take on a permanent job as an art director. I could get more credits, go and get those Can Lion awards and all that kind of thing. But for me, that's not what we want for our family. So it, it works much better. And I'm willing to do the trade-offs that mean there will be fewer opportunities in certain areas. But have you, so you've mentioned the pandemic and then now, but previously, or at least when you started your career or your journey, were you living in a city to build all the network and connections? And because now you've mentioned you already have referrals, you already know people, but to build that, did you have to be in like a big hub? No, not really. I mean, when I started my career, I was living in Sheffield, which is the fourth largest city in the UK, but it's not really... Um, a huge, or maybe fifth or something like that, but it's not really a huge place. You know, there's bigger conurbations, there's bigger cultural centers and things like that. I've always been in within striking distance of Manchester. Like I've lived within an hour of Manchester my whole life, and that's a significant place culturally. But no, I've not relied on that. And I think as one person, the, the these factors are not that relevant because you only need to, do enough for yourself. Like if you're a business and you want your business to be huge, like say, I want uh, to create an ad agency that's got 100 staff members. You might struggle to do that in a town of 50,000 people along, you know, if you're a long way from London or something like that, or you're a long way from Paris or New York. But if you just want to have a good life and make a good living and enjoy what you do, I feel like you can do that anywhere. By the way, I have a friend here who in Israel, I'm based in Israel and I live in Tel Aviv. It's like the big city, but I have a friend who owns a, a branding agency and she lives in a very small village in the North. So, and she have built like really an amazing company works internationally, has like about 30 people working for her. Now she has a very difficult time finding right good people because she is, again, she is in a kind of a remote position. But on the other hand, the flip side of this is that because there's not a lot of opportunities out there, everybody there, everybody who's a designer wants to work with her. So it's kind of like there's, I feel like there's two sides to this, uh, maybe being remote uh, in the opportunities. Yeah, the recruitment is a massive thing. There's um, there's actually a, an agency below where I'm sitting in my the building where my studio is. There's an agency on the ground floor, the landlord is the owner of that agency and he has about 15, 20 people and that's his biggest challenge recruitment. So that's interesting. So you also have an office outside of home. Why do you not work at home? I also, by the way, <laughs> but I want to hear your, your perspective. Why you do not work from home? Uh, easy answer. I've got three children under eight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here. It's just like uh, the, the hours when they're at home, it would be impossible to do to do work and I find it really good having that separation between I work when I'm at work and when I'm at home I'm at home and there's not that temptation to just go up and you know do a little bit of work and do that I really try and keep it separate as much as possible I worked from home until they were about three like three and one or something like that, and that at that point I was like okay I gotta get out uh, and now I love the separation um, so you've mentioned that you were thinking about the sole freelancer versus agency is that for yourself for your own business like what 
what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, th th this would be great. You could coach me on this, Ram. But um, we right. had a chat about <laughs> this about a year, 18 months ago. But um, I think we had a chat and I said to you, like, like, what do you think seeing from the outside? Like, what, you know, what is the next level for what I'm doing? And you're like, start an agency. And I was not keen uh, because... Did I say that? I, I, I yeah. <laughs> I think it was when you said around the chat when we were talking about, are we going to continue working together? And we had a pause and then we started again. And um, I think for me, the thing has been how I like to work and what I like to do. And also, I've I've done things in the past, you know, I've had, you know, small issues before and I've worked in other like more generalist in-house roles where I've been managing more people. And I got quite fatigued with that, with managing people, you know, in person, day to day. And it found it quite frustrating at times. And what I like about being a, like a solo freelancer is that I can just have the freedom to choose the projects that I want to work on. I can have a lot of flexibility with that. And it's allowed me to also work on the, as you, we've talked about, these more culturally significant projects. And if you want to do that, you have to work for, for, for somebody bigger, you know. I, so I've been, I've been in that place of kind of trying to figure that out really. And thinking, but what is the next level and where do I go from here? You know, I've, I've done really well. I'm thankful that I've been, you know, fully booked over the last couple of years and I make a good income, you know, especially based to compared to, you know, where I live or the national average or whatever. So I'm, I'm happy with that. I've got enough. I can look after my family. That's all I need. But I do, I'm an ambitious guy, you know, I'm a creative guy. I have ideas and I'm thinking about what is the next level. And I'm just trying to think if there are different models for a studio that can work and that could be something that would really fit with what I want to do and the way I want to work. And I'm trying to figure out what that is and what opportunities there are for scaling and, and going forward uh, from this point, really. It's interesting. Like I would start by asking, even before thinking about the agency, because the agency is the potentially a solution I would ask, number one, what are you optimizing for? Like, what are you trying to have more of? You know, some people want to make more money. Some people want to have more free time. Some people want to work on bigger culturally impacting uh, projects. Some people want the awards. So there are, there are all kinds of things that you might be optimizing for. Have you thought about this? Like, what what are you optimizing for? doesn't make for a great podcast, but that's where I'm right in the middle of. So literally on Monday night, when I went home and after putting the kids to bed, I got my journal out and I just started writing and writing down all these ideas and sort of mapping out. And I'm at that place where I'm torn between, do I just create like a real artistic, conceptual led design studio doing really creative and experimental work and sort of push down that way? Or do I cr try and create something where I'm a bit more removed from it and I've got a lot more time uh, that I can spend, you know, doing other things in my life? Or do I see how can I make the most revenue, you know, and, and set myself up more for the future? So that's, yeah, that's literally what I'm trying to figure out. So I'm, I'm in the pro, which might not be, like I said, that helpful to people listening, but I guess people can maybe relate to that. And it's, it is the important. I don't feel that, by the way, Matt, just, just to give you, I don't feel like this podcast needs to be helpful for people. It needs to be fun for us as a conversation. <laughs> if people want to tune in, good for them. <laughs> this is, I'm not optimizing for value in the podcast. This is, by the way, you know what? I think it's a good kind of like trend to, to answer your, uh, what, like you're thinking about this. I was at the, I just had like a, you know, 40, 40th birthday, how do you say it? And I don't know if it was kind of like, yeah, for the, I don't know if it was kind of like the, the midlife crisis that I had or, and kind of like, we've also had this, uh, transition in, in flux in terms of, you know, our focus and stuff like that. And that, that helped that, that was a trigger to help me think also, what am I trying to do? And, you know, where, where do I want to go? One of the things that I realized for myself is that I realized that, hey, you know what? I'm personally, I don't enjoy the tech, doing the technical videos anymore um, and maybe the design reviews anymore. 
I just really enjoy talking to my friends and that's that's what I want to do, right? So, and the podcast is basically just my outlet for just like getting back into, I don't, you know, you've probably heard about, it's very common on YouTube, like the creator, creator burnout. Like a lot of people, especially if they're really trying to hit numbers and go viral and stuff like that, it, it leads to burnout and you're, you're not enjoying it anymore. So this is kind of like the podcast is my way of just like, having a good time anymore and not worried about am I providing value right now or not? I mean, we provide value in, in our normal videos and in everything else that we do. So this is kind of like, and I, but honestly, as somebody who listens to podcasts, I do find it valuable to hear people that, you know, that I can learn from just chatting about their, their normal life and how they're thinking about these things. Um, yeah, I'm the same. I think it's one of those things that it comes up every few years, doesn't it? You, things reset naturally in life, you know, you go through cycles, you know, where you may be new to something and you, you're pushing your way into it and then you become accomplished at it and you find a way of, of doing it, but at that level, and then you realize, whoa, there's, there's a much bigger level. There's more opportunities. There's more, and you realize you have to go into that storming is again you know to to refashion things and reshape things and i think i'm sort of at, at the point now where i realize that's coming up and i think ah at the end of next year my week probably will look different to how it looks now but i don't yet know sort of the way there one thing i wanted to ask you about is what because you see you talk to a lot of people you know you interview you know people on the channel you obviously had just very successful freelance business yourself you work and teach with so many people like what interesting models are you seeing are you seeing people creating like different models of studios because like for example the guy you know is in the building below me and I'm, I'm i'm seeing another guy later this week and he has like an optimization agency that helps you know e-commerce uh, businesses with conversion and things like that and he's similar he probably has about 20 25 people and he's local and they very much have the model of you know every time they grow a little bit you know they add a little bit more business they just add people and they've got a very traditional model with account people and sales people and then people delivering the work designers and developers and motion graphic and video and things like that and they employ people locally they pay them on salaries uh, that are, you know, comparable for what that job pays in this area. And they have them in person about half the time, you know, and, and people are allowed some flexibility now. And so it's that very traditional thing. And I didn't want to be the guy atop of like 15 people just dealing with human resources issues every single day. But now, obviously, there's, there's remote, there's the opportunity to collaborate with people. And that's kind of how I do things now when I take on projects in my studio. If I want someone who's going to deliver some really exceptional motion graphics and, and mine are pretty average, I bring in the person, you know, who's right for that. Um, but I, are you seeing different models of, of solar yeah, panels think, and then studios yeah. and things like that? First of all, first of all, I think you can see it in flux and in, in a sense, most of Flux is what we would call collaborators, right? So we have we have two big teams. We have our coaches. Now we're going to start calling them mentors, I guess, which are all professional people who have their own freelance business. And a few, a few hours every week, they come into our community. They help the students. They give them feedback on work. And, you know, they help them out. So th that's a big group, you know, that we work with long term right and the way that we work with them can fluctuate meaning you know uh when we have more sales for a particular course we might tell a few of the people hey team we need a few more hours who can bring in more hours when one of them wants to take a vacation somebody else you know can fill in when one of them has a big client project they're saying for the next few weeks i need to lower so it's very it, it fluctuates the same thing happens on our, you know, creator side. So you're part of the of the creator team. We have a, a few collaborators. With them, it's not hourly based. It's more like content based, right? So, you know, this month you're gonna do so and so YouTube videos and so and so shorts. We're kind of like thinking about this in advance, sometimes like quarterly, let's think about this quarter. And so we have 
you know, that team that also kind of like fluctuates. Sometimes we, hey, this month we're launching this course. Let's do more videos on this topic. So this also kind of like fluctuates. And then we have what I would call like the core team, uh, which is basically, you know, the um, Kaya who manages our uh, support team and Burak who heads our marketing. Now we also have Ivan uh, helping us with creative direction on, on the YouTube content. And over there, I think I had a kind of like a paradigm shift very recently, which is I believed that the core team needs to be full-time people. Um, because first of all, uh, you know, that's what I'm seeing around me at companies. And it's, it feels like, you know, if you want the person to be dedicated and only thinking about your problem and, you know, there's a lot of work, so we need all the hours that they can bring and stuff like that. So I had the notion of, hey, we need to have full-time people. And then what happened with, with Burak, it's a, actually a really funny story. So what happened was, you know, we were interviewing him we, and, and then we decided to extend an offer. So we gave him, uh, we, we basically gave him an offer and then he took this offer and basically went to his client and said, I'm gonna leave you because I got this offer. Um, and their, his client basically said, you know what? We're going to basically, you know, give you more money and do a retainer or some, something like this. And so he came back to us and he basically said, look, I actually got this really great offer. It doesn't make sense for me to take it. However, that offer still leaves me like part-time position. So I know that's not what you're looking for, but how about we give this a try, right? And again, that's not what I wanted, but that's what I had and I really wanted to work with him. He's really great. So I was like, okay, let's give this a try. And <laughs> the, and then a crazy thing happened. You know, obviously, you know, it was a part time, so we paid him less. But he did everything and even better. So I'm like, wait, 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 wait. So this person is delivering on everything that, you know, I wanted him. Like great, great contributor. And he's doing this part time. I'm paying less. He can make more money because he's working on two different projects at the moment. This is like a complete win-win for everybody. And I, you know, I had concerns about reliability. You know, he won't be able to respond because he's on other projects and stuff like that. But we've, we're now working together for like six months and it's just like fantastic fit. So it, it kind of made a paradigm shift for me. So now we're trying this approach as well with, with Ivan and we'll see how that works. But that's also what I'm seeing um, with with people in design agencies. Um, we have a student that I don't want to say names, but he had a, a, a very successful, I would say, Webflow agency. And he had a team, I think, of maybe six or seven people. Very, very nice agency. And he it became too stressful for him to, you know, keep people on the payroll. You know, when you have that stress you start taking on projects, even if you don't want to take them because you need to pay people and stuff like that. And it kind of like, now you work for <laughs> maintaining what you have instead of, you know, building. Um, and he decided after a year or two to basically not fire everybody, but basically change the structure into saying, look, I, when I have project and I need your help, I'm going to tell you. So it's like a collaborator's, you know, don't count on me for your salary, but, you know, when we can, we can collaborate. If you're available, you know, that's, that's wonderful. Another example I can share with you is Yambo. I don't know if you, you're familiar, but he is, he is an amazing 3D uh, artist. Actually, I think he's going to be on the podcast maybe next week or in two weeks. He had built one of the most amazing 3D art agencies uh, in Israel, and he did work for a maid like he's doing advertisement for like chinese cell phone manufacturers and, and wix and like really big projects amazing amazing work the way he works is he has a he has a slack with a hundred you know in the 3d industry it's like very you know you need a lights person you need a materials person you need it's very very specialized um so he has a slack with like a hundred people that he trusts and that are really great people. And when he has a new project, he's like, who wants to work with me on this? Are you free? Are you free? And he's like dynamically building the team 
of really high-end people to deliver exceptional work. So again, it's like fluid teams. So that's that's basically what I'm seeing right now. It's like the model of the collaboration. I guess there's you know there's the gig economy, which is very well talked about. Uh, I don't know the numbers, but like every other person in the U.S. or whatever is going to be a freelancer next year or something like that. Don't catch me on the numbers. But I think the pandemic helped people to realize that you you can not only work from home, but you can work on multiple projects at the same time and still deliver like the amount of people. There were so many people in tech arriving because there were developers making and you know developer salaries in tech are high very high as it is and people were working two jobs their bosses didn't even know yeah um, yeah that's how i saw that and so and people were angry but i don't think it's like why if it's a win-win for everybody as long as like everybody's happy like so yeah but i that's what I'm they should they should be honest about it is my view like I think the bosses should have the yeah, yeah, yeah. and you've got like you're delivering what we're paying you to do so we're really happy that's no problem if your work's not suffering but if you sound but I think I, I think, being I think most, and that's different I agree however you I think what you need to acknowledge is the psychology of people and that's something that I had an issue with you know we I I would like to be in a you know a monogamous relationship I don't want you to be with other people. I don't want you to be working on other things. Why? Because, right? I had this assumption as well. Like, no, he won't be. He won't be come up with good ideas because he'll be distracted. He won't think about my project like twenty four hours a day in the shower, which is where the best ideas come from. So, there's the psychology factor into it, right? I don't know. I agree. But I think people will have to be a person I, of your word. Yeah. I think that's that's all I mean. No, no, no. I, I, I agree. I don't think I would do it, but I think I, I acknowledge the psychological problem. But, but again, I think it's going to change. I think people are going to change their mind just because people don't want <laughs> the, the most people don't want the full time commitment anymore. They're like, why would I commit? Like, I can, I want to be my own boss. Everybody wants to be their own. Yeah, yeah. Most I don't know. It's difficult. There again, like. I get offered full time things like all the time, but I'm just saying no straight away. I'm yeah, yeah. And I also think that I'm not a hundred percent sure. Again, I'm not doing the 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 admin for us. Thankfully, I have Noah, my wife, who takes care of you know paying people and and doing the finance. But I think that. There's, it's definitely simpler to work within that model where you're not, you don't have to work, you don't have to care about all of the HR stuff like, oh, now I have to buy them a computer and I have to pay for their whatever. You know, I, we pay for the work, you take care of the rest. It's, you can't argue, and I have read articles that it's not good for the employee, right? They're not getting whatever. Uh, they have more work for the same pay. And maybe. But I think, yeah, number one, that's what's happening. And number two, a lot of people opt into this because it's worth it. Like the freedom and the ability to change and to control their own life is just worth the the, the extra hassle. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> nice, nice, good. So you've mentioned you have too many ideas to work on what's what are those what are the in what realm the ideas are <laughs> i think it's well partly what we've talked about really it's it's that uh, balance between continuing what you've got to do and thinking about the future so like anyone listening to this is probably like man needs to go away and like have a think about what he really wants and you know how he's going to get there and i i am doing that i have started but like today like we've got another call at the end of the day you and i and in between that i've got a lunch meeting and either side of that lunch meeting i've got client work to do so that's my day and then i go home and put the kids to bed then go out and play football and then i'll be sleeping so it's it's one of you know we we always have that um 
where I've got to create that space, you know, to be able to. Uh, but the summers are. I, you know what? I want to push you back on this and say, I don't necessarily think that what you need is time to think. I think that uh, now I'm just talking from my experience. So, number one, you know, when I had this, I don't know, I was overwhelmed or stressed or not sure about the direction. I didn't, number one, I, I didn't feel like anything. It's like, what do you want to do? Nothing. I want to just be on the beach and read books and I don't want to do anything, right? <laughs> what are you passionate about? I'm not passionate about anything. <laughs> like, so, and then if you put yourself in the loop of what do I want? What is the right thing? You can get into a loop of thinking too much. And my, I was just sharing this story with a friend the other day. I a few years ago, somebody told me, hey, you need to write your vision for the future. What would your life look like in five years? And no, now I don't do these things, but like apparently five years ago, I did it. And I wrote it down. It was like, here's what your life is going to look like in 2023. And it's like, here's, you know, where you're going to live and your kids and, and your life and your work. And turns out the life actually looks pretty pretty close, like very, very close to what I've forecasted. My work looks zero. Like there's everything that I've like forecasted for my vision of what. So it was like run a software business because I had Prosper. It was like a software business with 20 employees and travel the world doing lectures and consulting. I was like, I'm not doing any of this. I'm super happy. Like I live the life that I want to live, but the business happened from a completely different direction, which I could have not forecast, like predicted or, or anything like that. So, and it just happened by trying things, right? Like, oh, you do a video and then you do a course and then you kind of rolled into it. And I think you are doing this as well, right? And like what you have mentioned, like what we have today is today we have, we have a new project called Studio Experience where we basically took a few students, select students, and we work with them on a real client project and we have the kickoff with the client today. I don't know what's going to happen with this, but I feel like it's an experiment that might roll into something like what, does Flux open up an agency right now? Like what, what is this? I don't know, but feels like something might happen and we're doing this. Might not make money for us, might be a, I don't know, but feels like fun and let's do it. So it's, it's, I don't think it's going to be solved by thinking down and thinking it's worth, you know, thinking about the perspective of, Hey, what am I optimizing for? Just, I don't know, but it's, yeah. Yeah. You I get mean, caught up with too much thinking. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that's good. I mean, as you brought it up, that's one thing that I decided to do was, uh, be part of this project, this studio experience project, because that will tell me a lot about working in that particular way on this sort of project. So my experience of this project will probably, well, it will definitely give me thoughts about what I want to do in the future, you know, like as every project that you work on does. So yeah, I've, I'm fully believing yeah, it's it's them. You've it's got to keep moving yeah. forward. And uh, as you keep moving forward, it's a lot easier to change direction. 